Well, welcome to Dorset Shoals Wednesday Night Live. My name is Steve Smith. I'm the pastor here at Dorset Shoals Baptist Church. And just going through our Wednesday night lesson that we normally go with our adults here on Dor at Dorset Shoals. And I uh, just want to continue on as we have been walking through the book of Colossians. And this is a book that Paul wrote while in his Roman imprisonment. And so while we see that from the very big point of that he is in prison writing these things to these churches that uh, we've been looking at over the last few months. So we're going to go ahead and jump right in to chapter 2. And one of the things I want to kind of preface as we go into chapter 2 is that chapter 2, he really starts to go after the Gnostics. Now, the Gnostics were a group of people who were trying to come into the church and to really kind of rewrite some things, you know, to say, well, this is what needs to happen, and this is what we really believe about God. And so he's one, the Gnostics were one of the main reasons why Paul was writing to this church to help them to remember and to see who these people were and what the falsehood and what they were teaching. Now, a couple of things I just want to kind of start this off with, some of the Gnostic teachings. So we'll have an idea, as, and you'll see some of these as it comes out in Paul's writing. But a couple of things about the Gnostics. Number one, Gnosticism taught that God, as a perfect spirit, could not come into direct contact with the material world. This will be something you'll see over and over. Uh, the second one, Gnosticism also taught that since God could not have direct contact with the material world, that God himself did not create the world, but he worked through lesser spirits or angels. And so, again, you'll see uh, Paul addressing this with them throughout this book. The third thing, um, Gnosticism and some forms of Jewish mysticism taught that God did not deal directly with man and the material world, but that he dealt with the world through a series of mediators and then the final one, Gnosticism and some forms of Jewish mysticism greatly esteemed those supposed mediators and considered them angelic beings of a sort. And so you see, here's what Paul is going against. He's got this group that's trying to come in here and, and obfuscate what's going on in the church to try to say, okay, yeah, but this is what it really means. This is what it really means. And so he's really coming against these folks. So you'll see the, a lot of this as we go through it. And so just kind of keep this in mind as we walk through chapter 2. So chapter 2 starts out and it says this in verse 1, For I want you to know how great a struggle I have on your behalf and for those who are at Laodicea and for all those who have not personally seen my face, that their hearts may be encouraged, having been knit together in love and attaining to all the wealth that comes from the full assurance of understanding, resulting in a true knowledge of God's mystery, that is Christ himself in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I say this so that no one will delude you with persuasive arguments. For even though I am absent in body, nevertheless I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good discipline and the stability of your faith in Christ. So the first thing we kind of see here is Paul writes to them, you know, he's having a struggle on their behalf. Now, what he's meaning by this is not like, you know, he's, you know, having a struggle getting a letter to them or he's having trouble writing. This is just showing the emotion of what he's going through, that he really cares for these folks, even though he hadn't seen them. You know, as we've talked about, as we led up to this, he never really met these people. He never saw them. He, this was not a church that he had started. And so what happens here is he does have this struggle. And what this means is kind of a striving. He's, he's really struggling. He, he's concerned. There's something he wants them to know. And so it's one of these things we see um, that as Paul, as a believer in Christ, I think he would have really stepped up his thoughts on other people because he knew what it was like to be lost. You know, he knew what it was like to really believe something and then to see that come crashing down under the truth of the weight of Christ. And so he really would have done that. It's something interesting to me because I think sometimes um, that people who come to Christ later in life after having walked uh, a, a lost path uh, tend to be more empathetic to people who do not know Christ than those who have walked with Christ most of their life. And that's not to cast any kind of aspersions, please don't think that, but I've just seen it so many times that those who seem to come to Christ later in life, they remember, they say, yes, I, I can remember these persuasive arguments. I can remember when I was lost. I can remember this, you know, the things I thought that were so anti-biblical. And so they almost have like a, a, a greater push 
for those who are lost. I think we see this with Paul here, that he's like, I'm struggling because I hear that, you know, you have people coming against you. I want you to know Christ. I want you to hold fast to what you've learned, you know, to come to follow Jesus Christ. So when he talks about that struggle, it's always good for us to ask ourselves, do we have that struggle for other people? Because he's talking about this struggle, this internal drive for them, and he's never met them. He's never talked to them. He's never, you know, shaken hands with any of them. And so it's something that we have to ask ourselves, do we feel that struggle for those around us? You know, so you're going to ask that question in just a second. But he talks to them because he wants them to be encouraged, you know, that their hearts may be encouraged because he understands how Satan can use uh, a discouraged Christian, you know, how the world just really absolutely, you know, falls prey or, or tries to get the disheartened, depressed Christian because it's so easy for the world to beat them down, for Satan to beat them down. And so Paul knows this, so he wants them to be encouraged. You know, he talks about them having been knit together in love and attaining to all the wealth that come from the full assurance of understanding. This right here, I think, is where he's starting to kind of poke at the, uh, the Gnostics. The Gnostics were all about knowledge, you know, that we know more. We're, we're smarter than that. And we, you know, you, you rubes who think that God came and created the earth, he's a material, you know, he's a non-material, but he could, you know, they're really trying to bring out this, we have a greater knowledge than you. And so Paul's really kind of starting to tweak them a little bit as he talks about this, you know, the full assurance of understanding. You know, if you want the full assurance of understanding, what do you need to know? You need to know Christ. You know, because when you know Christ, this will result in the knowledge of God's mystery. And what is God's mystery? Christ himself. You know, how this man died on this cross to save us from our sins. And that's all you need to know. You know, he's not really trying to sit here and say, oh, the Gnostics have it. He's saying, you know, they're, they're trying to do some kind of greater knowledge, but the greater knowledge is already there. It is Christ is the greater knowledge. And so he's really trying to push this. He also gives him a little line here in verse 3 when it says, "...in whom are hidden the treasures of wisdom and knowledge." You know, and that was a direct, really, line to the Gnostics because that's where the big thing they were about. They were like, we seek wisdom and knowledge. And so Paul is sitting here saying, yeah, you don't need to seek it anymore. It's right here with Jesus Christ. Stop trying to make it up yourself and just focus on this. Now, of course, we see this in our world, too. You know, I think it's so interesting to me that so many times, you know, subsequent generations always seem to want to rewrite things, always want to see that, you know, ah, the generation before us wasn't as smart. The generation wasn't before us as smart. So many times people, I think, look back at the biblical writers and just want to say that they are ignorant folks. You know, they don't know as much as we know. Now, true, there's some thir certain things that have come up through science and things like that that we know more, but to just suddenly sit there and say, oh, they're ignorant because of it, and it needs to be redone. You know, it, it's one of the things that just floors me about people that talk about today. This, you know, we, we've got to change it. We know the real things today, you know, versus the thousands of years that came before. You know, those people were dumb. And so we've got to really understand this, that there's going to be times that people are going to say, oh, well, we know more now, so we need to change what came before. And it's like, wait a minute now, that's not always the truth. And when we come at it and we look at the people that came before us and we think that they're just ignorant, you know, it's like, wait a minute, we're missing a point. There's a lot of smart people back then, a lot of smart people now too. But when we start to diminish someone who came before just simply because they came before, uh, we're going to be heading in for some rough times. And so Paul's really starting this, uh, this discussion against the Gnostics. He's really trying to get them to see. He's like, hey, true wisdom and true knowledge is in Jesus Christ. And that's where it's from. And so church, remember that. Remember when all these people come against you, he, he again says it, don't let anyone delude you. When they come and they say, well, we have true knowledge and we have true wisdom, it's like, no, we have it right here in Jesus Christ. Okay, so i got a couple of questions for you here. Number one, what shows us that we are struggling for our fellow Christians? And I want to kind of put a little addendum here, you know, not just our fellow Christians, but for the world, for the lost of our world. You know, what you see Paul struggling here. You know, he writes it, he says it, you know. And now, of course, we don't know his characteristics about what's going on towards this. But that's what I want to ask you. You know, for us to struggle, as Paul is struggling for this, these new Christians, as we struggle for our fellow Christians, as we struggle for our, uh, the lost world around us, for those who we come across, what characteristics do we see of that? What shows that in our actions, all right? And then second question, what are some of the persuasive arguments that you have dealt with in the past? That people have come and said, oh, well, here's my persuasive argument against Christianity or, or why Jesus is just one of many ways or things like that. 
So y'all talk about that persuasive arguments for just a minute, all right? So y'all talk about that, and we'll be right back with our next segment. Hope you had a good discussion on that, and we'll just continue on as we see Paul continuing to talk to the church about this Gnostic influence that's been coming in. So it says this in verse 6, Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him, having been firmly rooted and now being built up in Him and established in your faith, just as you were instructed and overflowing with gratitude. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception, according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. Okay, so the first thing he's like, you know, hey, you've received Jesus Christ. You know, the, the leader came, he told me, you know, Epaphras, he told me that, hey, you have uh, received Christ, so walk in him. You know, and it's one of these things that is almost simplistic in what he's saying. It's very similar to how just about every week, uh, either in the Sunday sermon or Wednesday night lesson, you know, we talk about having a daily unhurried quiet time. You know, we look and we say, that's so simplistic. You know, if you want to grow in Christ, have a daily unhurried quiet time. And there's such a truth to that. And the thing is, when he's talking about this, he's like, if you have received Christ, you have received him, walk in him. Do what he told you to do. You know, be doing the things that he told you to do. And then he kind of goes to this. He said, having been firmly rooted, you know, and here's the thing I think is very interesting what he's saying here. When we think of something that's rooted, we think of a tree. And, you know, having had to work in my yard over the last couple of weeks, you know, back in the wintertime, we had a, a two or three really bitter cold snap and um, it killed a bunch of my bushes. And so I was taking some of them out. And it was funny because many of them who had died, you know, I could just pull right out. The roots had died and shriveled up. And so I could just pull it right out of the ground because the roots had dried up. But there was a few that the roots had stayed strong. Now, not strong enough to keep the plant alive, but the roots were so intricate that, boy, it took me forever to pull those out. And I had, there, there's one that's still there. I'm going to have to, I don't know how I'm going to get it out. You know, but it's just one of these things that he's trying to say to us, you're firmly rooted. Be firmly rooted in Christ so that when something comes and pulls against you, that, hey, it can't pull you out. It can't de-root you because your roots are so deep into Christ and not these things that people are trying to tell you. So stay rooted in Christ. Walk with him, being built up in him. And then he kind of goes to this where he's like, okay, you know, stay rooted in him, walk in him, do what he would tell you to do so that no one takes you captive. You know, and this is, again, this picture of someone who is coming and doing something essentially against your will. 
You know, they're coming and taking you captive. They are absolutely you know, saying, here it is, and suddenly you become their slave. You become someone that is captured by what? And he says this, through philosophy and empty deception. You know, people talking about this, oh, we've got to look even deeper, and here's what the philosophy of the thing tells us, or just simple deception. You know, hey, this isn't what it is. You know, I know you think this is what it is, but it's not because I'm telling you it's not. You know, and so he's trying to do this and saying, don't let him take you crafted through philosophy and empty deception. And then I think he kind of hits a little deeper here, according to the tradition of men. And when we look at the tradition of men to who this group would have been, the tradition of men would have been, in fact, a little bit of Judaism. Because remember, they were also fighting against Judaism because Judaism was trying to say, well, you need to keep doing what we told you to do. You know, yeah, you can accept Jesus and stuff, but you need to keep doing what we're doing. You know, you need to keep the Torah. You need to be circumcised. You need to have all these things because of, you know, that. So they were trying to say, okay, well, you've got to continue on with our traditions. And so he's trying to say here, don't let the traditions of men take you captive. Don't let Judaism take you captive. And then, according to the elementary principles of the world, you know, here is what the, the, uh, the Gnostics were trying to do. They're saying, oh, here's this wisdom, and here's this that we know, and we know this deeper meaning that you don't know. He's like, stop doing this. You know, the people are trying to put meaning where there is no meaning, who are trying to take away what Christ is to try to build themselves up and to say that they have some kind of knowledge that no one else has. And again, this is, this is on us. You know, we just can't sit there and say, oh, well, the, you know, shame on them. Well, yeah, shame on them, but shame on us. Because if we let that happen, and, and I look in our world right now, and, and I absolutely see this happening in our churches today, where people are, the traditions of men taking over. You know, where it's like, here's other religions coming in that are, are saying, well, you have, to, you have to acknowledge us too. You know, you have to do this. I was like, no, you're false. No, I'm not going to do this. You know, all religions are the same. No, they're not. There's only one that's true. You know, and I mean, there's the thing we go to. And so then these elementary principles of the world, you know, where, yeah, you need to be able to, you know, have what you want in this world and also Jesus too. You know, you need to do these things. And, and through science, we're going to do all this stuff and, and try to disprove Christianity and all these things. It, it's so funny to me because you never see uh, science going after Islam. You never see science going after Buddhism. What do you always see it going after? Always going after Christianity. And so the thing is, what Paul's trying to say to them is continue to walk in Christ, be rooted in Christ, because what's going to happen? These things are always going to come against you. They're always going to blow against you. They're going to try to pull you up. And the sad thing about it is, just like some of those plants that I tried to pull up that were already dead, they came up really easy. There was absolutely no resistance whatsoever. Versus some of these that, you know, they absolutely, I'm still trying to get them out because they're so deeply rooted. May our faith be that same way. Where our faith is so deeply rooted that when the world tries to come against us, be it the traditions of man or the elementary principles of the world or philosophy or empty deception, that when it tries to pull against us, it sees somebody who is deeply rooted and who will not be shaken, who will not be turned, who will not be pulled. And when we see that, we'll see someone of strong faith. Now, where does that faith come from? We know that it comes from walking in Christ. How do we walk with Christ? <laughs> you know what I'm going to say. Unhurried quiet time. Are you spending time with him every single day? Your Bible study. Are you spending time with him every day? Are you attending church? Not for the simple fact of just I am in the building, but no, I am having fellowship with my fellow Christians. I'm talking. I'm sharing my life with others. When I have struggles, I share them with my Christian fan, friends and uh, fellow church members. If I have triumphs, I'm rejoicing, you know, and things like that that we look at. And most of all, when Christ tells me to do something, I'm doing it. Because when you do that, you are going to find that knowledge. You are going to find and be deeply rooted. So when the world comes for you, it's not going to find very much that it can get a hold of. All right, so I only have one question here, so I just kind of keep a look at this. What are some activities that enables believers to be rooted in Christ? So I kind of helped you out there a little bit with some of the, the uh, common ones, but what's some of the, maybe the more uncommon ones that help us to remain rooted in Christ? All right, so y'all talk about that for just a moment, and we'll be right back.
All right. Well, again, I hope you had a good discussion on that question, maybe brought up a whole lot more of how we can be what God would have us to be so that we would be rooted in Christ and not pulled up by empty deception. Well, we're going to get in here into the, the uh, third section of our uh, walk through Colossians chapter 2 right now. And this right here is where he really, Paul really does just kind of go after the Gnostics and some of their beliefs. So we'll take a look at that. So I'll remind you to look back again at some of those beliefs that the Gnostics had. And we'll see him as Paul really just kind of goes after him. And it starts in verse 9 where he says this, For in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form, and in him you have made you have been made complete, and he is the head over all rule and authority. And in him you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, in the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised up with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made your, you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. When he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over the them through him. All right, so you see a really good, almost a Christian hymn here as it talks about who Christ is. But again, the first thing we see is where he really just takes, hey, Gnostics, listen up. In him, the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. You know, so he's really saying to him, you know, y'all say that God can't exist in material form. Well, absolutely he did. He existed in Jesus Christ. You know, so for all those who want to say, oh, no, God's, God can't exist in material form because of its sinfulness. Nope, he did because he had no sin. And so he just puts it right there at the first. And I think one of the things that we should take from this is that, you know, there's going to be times that we're just going to have to come and say it to people. You know, when people want to say, oh, well, you know, Jesus is one of many ways. You know, I, I have a lot of respect for Jesus. He's, he's one of the ways. We have to come back with, no, he's not one of many ways. He is the only way. That's it. Well, we can agree to disagree. No, we can't. No, no, we can't. Because your soul's on the line. Because no, Jesus is not one of many ways. He is the only way. And if he's not the only way, then he's a liar and he's not any way. So, I mean, that's the thing we got to look at. Sometimes we've got to be very um, abrupt's not the right word, but we've got to be able to say, you know, hey, I'm not going to fence. I'm not going to mince words with you here. Jesus is the only way, and that's all there is to it. And that's what Paul is doing to the, uh, to the, um, the Gnostics here. And then he kind of goes after, again, a little bit of the Jewish thought, too, where he talks about you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. You know, that, hey, here's this straight-up Judaism right here. You know, yeah, there was a circumcision, but it wasn't made with hands. It wasn't a physical circumcision. It was a spiritual circumcision because it was a removal of the body of the flesh, the old fallen nature that you had, that old fallen sin nature that was exposed to us through the Old Testament, that showed us what it was. What did Jesus do through his death and resurrection? He circumcised in the removal of that old sinful nature, that old sinful uh, fallen nature that we had. He removed that. And that's the circumcision that we're talking about. And then he goes on, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised up through him through faith. You know, and the Jewish people would have understood baptism. That's where we, you know, Christians, that's where we got baptism was through the Jews. And so he, they understood this picture of, you know, the old person falling away and the new person rising up. And so what he's saying here is this is the same picture. We saw Jesus who was fallen, who was killed, put in the tomb. But yet then three days later, he rose up again. And what he's saying is we are connected with that, that we too we're, we're dead in our transgressions. We were walking dead people, essentially. And then what happened? Christ came. We accepted him. And then we died. And then we were raised to walk in newness of life. We've got a new life. We've got a new heart. And that's something that should be exciting to us. It's something that we should say, you know what? I want to tell other people about this. You know, that this is what I used to be and now I'm this. You know, one of the things we always try to get to, to do with people when they talk about their testimony is to say what they were and now what they are, and then what changed them. 
You know, when I look at my life, what was I before I accepted Christ? How did I act? What did I do? You know, in my very self-centered, always looking at myself, wanting what I wanted to do. You know, the the go along to get along kind of guy. Yeah, all things point to one thing. You know, something like that. Then Christ came in, you know, and I accepted him. And then after that, my life changed. My my whole viewpoint changed. My worldview changed. And, you know, it, it changed from one of, you know, just, okay, well, it's all about me to, no, it's not about me. You know, it's about what God would have. It's about what Christ would have. And so that old Steve died away, and now a new Steve rose in his place. I think that's one of the things we always have to remember is that, you know, when Christ came in, he changed us. And if you can look and you can sit there and say, well, you know, I, I really didn't change that much, you know, from, from when I accepted Christ. You know, I'm, not, I'm kind of the same person I was before. Well, then you really need to look and see if Christ really came in. Because it will be something. I mean, if somebody's dead and then they walk away from that, that's pretty transformative. That's pretty different. If you could look and say, well, I was dead, but then I just kind of walked the same way, there's something wrong. And so he's really point, pointing to the Gnostics and to the Jews at this point. He's saying, this isn't in it, folks. You know, y'all don't have it. Y'all are wrong. You're going down the wrong path. And this is where you need to be going. And why? <coughs> Excuse me. Why? Because Christ is going to be victorious. Because what did he do? We were all sinners. You know, we all had transgressions. He talked about this uh, certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us. You know, who do we sin against? We sin against God. You know, we can sin and, and it's going to hurt other people and we might, you know, cause issue to other people. But our sin, it really comes down to God. We confront God. We are, our sin is an affront to him. And he is the one who has that certificate of debt against us. It's like, yeah, you broke this. You did not do this. You did not follow the what I told you to do. But through Christ, that debt has been paid, and he paid for it on the cross. And Paul here kind of emphasizes that by saying, having nailed it to the cross. You know, it was nailed to the cross, you know, because they would that audience would have understood in particular, no, things went to the cross to die. You know, things didn't go to the cross for, for life. They went to the cross for death. And so that, that our transgressions, our decrees against us, that was nailed to the cross so it would die under the blood of Jesus Christ. And so we look and we say, amen. We look at that. Well, we're getting excited. You know, I mean, that's just the way it should be. And then all you rulers and authorities, all you people who think you know what you've got going on, all the people who think, ah, those silly Christians. No, no, no. He says this. When he disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. And this is God saying, yeah, absolutely. He has triumphed over the supposed rulers, the supposed authorities, the people who think they know more. He has triumphed over them. And what he talks about, this, this public display of them, this would have brought to mind what the Romans did when they, when they conquered something. Because when the Romans conquered a, a people, what they would do is they'd usually get like the leadership, you know, if, they, if the king was still alive or, or the royalty was still alive, what they would do is they'd have a parade right through the middle of Rome and, you know, they'd have the, the, the general who conquered, the people, the soldiers, and then they would have a group of those people who were conquered in chains and they would parade them up and down and say, look, this is what we did. This is who we conquered. And what Paul is saying here is Jesus did this, or, or excuse me, God has done this. And who's his general leading the parade? It is Jesus, because he conquered them through Jesus. So again, we look at our own lives, and we know there's going to be trials, there's going to be struggles, there's going to be people who are going to come against us, there are going to be people who are going to absolutely uh, try to cause issue for Christians and for his church. But the thing about it is this, he's won. And how do we know he was won? Because the cross. Because the cross that was its instrument of death has now turned and been transformed into an instrument of life to those who would follow and trust in him. And so we see this through Paul who's really trying to sit, get them to see that, hey, don't fall back into old ways. Don't follow the logic of this world. You follow Jesus Christ and what he has done because you are changed because of him. All right, got a couple of questions here for you. Number one, how would you try to convince someone that Jesus is divine? Okay, you know, the Gnostics were like, oh, no, Jesus couldn't have been, you know, because material is sinful, and if he was there, he couldn't be divine. But we know that he was. So how would you say to somebody, yep, he was divine? You know, how do you, how do you talk to somebody about that? Okay, and the second question, what were you like before Christ? And I think that's a really important thing for us to remember. We forget it too often. We forget it too often what we were, and suddenly we try to go back and, yes, I was always saved. I was always this way. Nope, you were changed. 
And again, you need to really examine this because if there wasn't much change, there might not be a lot of Jesus. Okay, so y'all talk about that for just one moment. We'll be right back with our final segment. Well, as we come and start to finish this lesson out, I think you know the big thing we see here again is Paul is taking on the Gnostics. He's taking on the, uh, the, the intellectuals of the day, the people who were thinking that, okay, well, it can't just be this simple. You know, we've got to add our own take to it. He's also taking on the Jewish tradition that's saying, oh, well, you've got to still do our stuff too. You know, and he's trying to do this. And what we've always got to understand is that we're going to have to take this on too. And it always starts out with this, because we can always look outside and say, oh, look at these people and, and this group, the freedom from religion group, you know, the, the progressive Christianity group. We can always look at people like that and say, ah, look, see, there they are. But what we always have to remember is this starts first and foremost in our own heart. Because here's the thing, you know, people talk about, oh, they don't like it when Jehovah's Witnesses come by or Mormons come by. They don't like being confronted with it and stuff like that. And I'm like, you know, I don't mind it. Because guess what? I'm not changing my thoughts because I'm rooted in Christ. You know, you can come in and you can have your persuasive arguments. I have a friend of mine um, who he, he's really good at this. He, he almost takes it as a challenge when the Jehovah's Witness comes by. And he does a really good job because what he does is he, he will talk to him. He'll say, I'll listen to you. You'll listen to me. You know, and he's deeply rooted in his faith. And so he knows that when they start talking and they're telling him everything like this and that and other thing, and he's like, okay, 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 you going to listen to me now? And then he gives them the gospel and tells them the truth. You know, and the thing is, it's because he's rooted in that. It starts in his heart first and foremost. And when we're going to make a defense of Jesus Christ, when we're going to make a defense of Christianity, we've got to remember that we've got to make that defense to ourselves first and foremost. Because, yes, the, the sinful nature, the fallen nature has been, you know, circumcised from us, as the Scripture said. But we still hold that sinful thoughts. There are always going to be those things that are going to try to pull against us, and Satan's going to try to use it in our own heart. So it starts with us first and foremost. And we say, okay, well, how do I get that rooted? We talked about it. Y'all answered a question about it. You know, are you in your daily unhurried twilight time? Are you in your prayer time? Are you seeking God's will every day, not sometimes? You know, if your seeking of God consists of Sunday morning and that's it, you're going to be wounded. You're going to be hurt. You're going to be captive by an empty philosophy and empty deceit from people around you. But when you're focused on God all the time and you see and you know, the wisdom and the knowledge comes from it, because here's the thing about it, I don't want you to get this impression. It's like, well, that's just brainwashing. You know, if you do this enough, you'll just be brainwashing to believing it. No, if you do this every day, you'll get the wisdom and the knowledge that you're seeking. You know, because that's the thing we see. 
is here's the Gnostics and the Jewish people who are trying to say, no, no, you got to keep doing it our way, our way, our way, because our way is the wisdom and knowledge. It's like, no, it's not. It's through Jesus Christ. And the more you know, the more you're dedicated to it, the more you see this, the more you find it, and the more everything comes together. This puzzle piece, this mystery of God shows up and we see it. It is Jesus Christ. And so it's very important for us to see that. It's because the, the battle starts in our own heart first and foremost. And then the second thing, when we do see people and we are confronted with people, are we going to stand up and take that, that position of saying, you know, no, I'm not going to agree to disagree. But I'm not going to say that Jesus is one of many ways. I'm not going to say that, you know, there's other paths to enlightenment. No, it's not. Jesus is it. And the thing is, this isn't necessarily for you. I think it is to a certain degree. Yeah, it's strengthening your faith. But we need to confront a fallen world. How many people are going to go to hell thinking that, well, I trusted in this and it was one of many ways. That I, I trusted in this because it was, you know, this new age thought. You know, the, the, the preacher, pastor, shaman, imam, whatever, they told me that I was fine. That, hey, just because you live in this area of the world, this is your God. No, nope, there's only one God. And Jesus Christ is that God. Jesus Christ died on the cross so that we might have fellowship with the Father, that we might forever dwell with him. And why? Because of his love for us. And so the thing is, if we are kowtowing, if we are looking and not giving people the truth, and now giving, giving it in love, not giving it with anger and vitriol, but when we give the truth in love, we're telling people that, no, Jesus Christ is the only way. He is the only way for true knowledge. He's the only way for true wisdom. And he's the only way for salvation. So are we going to tell people that? Are we going to go against the battles of the empty deceit and the empty philosophies and the elementary principles of our world? We've got to fight those every single day in our world today, just as they did back then. So are you going to fight? That's the big question. All right, let's have a word. Dear Father God, Lord, we come before you. And Lord, we thank you for the knowledge and the wisdom of who you are. Lord, as I look in my own life and, and know that there were so many years that I walked in darkness, that I walked without it, and, and Lord, that, that I too, as I would listen to people talk about it, you know, that the elementary principles of the world, it made sense to me that, oh yeah, absolutely, those who grew up in this country, that would be their God, and you know, all this would be their God. But then when I accepted you, Lord, suddenly I found true wisdom and true truth. And Lord, that you told me and you showed me that, Lord, I found the wisdom, found wisdom and knowledge, not in my own self, but through you. So, Lord, I pray that you would continue to use Christians in this way. And Lord, that we would be strong, that we would not give in to the temptation to just be equitable, to just be, you know, uh, get along to get along. But, Lord, that we would make sure that we always stand on your truth so that those around us would know your truth. And Lord, they would not fall to the prey of the principles of this world, the empty deception of man, the empty principles. But Lord, that they would seek you and you above all things. So Lord, help us that that starts in our heart, that we would seek you every single day. And Lord, we would not forego our unhurried quiet time. We would not forego our Bible time. And we would not forego meeting and assembling together with our fellow members or fellow church members. So, Lord, again, help us to be examples of you as we go through this dark world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you so much for joining with me tonight. And just want to kind of remind, uh, just one announcement, really, um, for our ladies. Our ladies' Bible study will be starting at Stephen Amanda's house this week. Um, it's going to be 5 o'clock at our house. Bring a little snack, something like that, to munch on. And it's going to be, I can't remember the exact title, but it's going to be about Job. And it's a great little study. You can look online and, and see a little more about that. Look at our email and you can see a little bit more about where to buy the book and stuff. But um, it's going to be like a seven-week study. should be something really good. So I hope, that, ladies, you will come and be a part of that. Then also, we also have our Grow Ministry that's going to be starting back in uh, September. Not the first uh, sa Saturday first Sunday uh, because of Labor Day, but it will start the second Sunday where the GNR teams will be meeting, going out and praying for our community. But again, thank you for joining us. I hope that you will be back here as we will continue walking through the book of Colossians and seeing how Paul writes to this church to strengthen them and to encourage them as they battle against the dark forces of this world 
who are trying to corrupt them. All right, see you next week.